I could talk about the bad bosses, but I had a really good boss who was a former a Navy commander, very gruff, but inside just a softy. And he pushed me outside of my comfort level constantly. Um, I was, before I got into the printing business, I, I was in the medical waste business. And um, he had me speaking um, nationwide about the environmental impact of incineration and medical waste. And, um, and so he hired the man who wrote the regs for EPA to train me. And, um, and he, he pushed me and I was so uncomfortable with that. I'm an, an introvert and feeling like I'm in front of these very highly educated people and I'm going to be speaking on this topic, but without his push, I, I wouldn't have done that. Who knows who I would be or where I'll be without him. So a uh, big shout out to Bob Lewis. Yeah. Hey, Bob, way to go, Bob. Look, look what you did. <laughs> <laughs> In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to another edition of The Root of All Success. Today's guest is Sherry Deutschman, right here in Nashville, one of the most powerful entrepreneur ladies here in town. And uh, you're going to love her story. But I want to say thank you for for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing and listening. If you're driving in your truck to work or your car or you're out walking the dog, you're exercising or whatever you're doing right now, I just want to say from me to you, thank you very much. I want to say thank you for listening. I do this show to help you, to help you get better, to become a better entrepreneur, to grow, to learn to get perspective, because I think that's what we all need is more perspective. So when I interview these people on these show, on this show, I think it gives us all more perspective. So thank you for listening. And if you haven't subscribed or left a five-star review, it would mean a lot to me if you do that, because the more people who do that, the more people get to see and hear us. Yes, you can see us. If you haven't watched us on YouTube, you can go to The Real Jason Duncan uh, on YouTube. You can just search for The Real Jason Duncan or go to youtube.com slash the real Jason Duncan. We're also so we're also on C Suite TV. So if you have access to C Suite TV, you can go watch us there. So thank you for tuning in. All right, let's introduce Sherry Deutschman. Sherry Deutschman um, is a serial entrepreneur. She's an author. She's a passionate advocate for entrepreneurship, which you'll hear in her voice as she tells stories later. In 2019, Sherry founded a company called Brain Trust, dedicated to helping women entrepreneurs grow their businesses. And she's going to talk about on the show how that nationally only 1.7% of women-owned businesses ever get to a million dollars in annual revenue. And through peer-to-peer learning, 10% of the Brain Trust members in her organization have reached that milestone in just their first year in business. That's amazing. Prior to founding Brain Trust, she was the CEO of Letter Logic, which was a company that she grew from her basement. You're going to hear a great story about how she started that to $40 million. Uh, Letter Logic has been named on the Inc. 5000 list as one of the pri- fastest growing privately held companies in the country 10 times in a row. That's that's un- that's insane. That's absolutely insane. I've got one of my companies been on there twice, but to have 10 times in a row is crazy. And she attributes her success at Letter Logic to its unique culture, which we're going to talk a lot about on the show today. If you are interested in how culture works in a company, this is the show you need to tune into. Um, the culture that she created there led her to be recognized by EY as one of their 2009 entrepreneurial winning women. And Letter Logic was featured in New York Times, Forbes Magazine, Business Leaders, Inc. Magazine, and Fast Company. And she was honored by President Barack Obama as the White House Champion of Change in 2016. 
Sherry's book, which we're going to talk about on the show today, is called Lunch with Lucy, Maximize Your Profits by Investing in Your People, was released in 2020, and she's even won a couple of awards, which we're going to talk about. We'll talk about the book today, and uh, there's lots of cool stuff in this story. You do not want to miss this. So join me in welcoming Sherry Deutschman to the show. Well, Sherry, welcome to the show. I am honored to finally get to talk to you on the show. We've been trying to do this for a while, so thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, you know, you are a very powerful entrepreneurial woman here in the Nashville area, and I have known about you for a very long time. And I know a lot of other people have, because like I talked about in the intro, you've won lots of awards, not only you personally, but the companies that you've owned and founded. When did you get your start as an entrepreneur? A lot of people say there was something as a kid, they shoveled snow or mowed grass or something, but, but some people don't start until they're an adult. For you, what, when did it start as an entrepreneur for you? Oh, I don't know how entrepreneurial it is, but uh, years ago, in my late teens and early 20s, I uh, had a little business where I scrubbed um, toilets. So I cleaned gas station bathrooms um, for $5 a stall. And, uh, and then later, I guess my real entrepreneurial you know, journey began with you know, being dissatisfied with uh, an employer and just starting a business competing with him. Oh, really? So you were so you were working for someone and you didn't like the way they were doing it. And you thought, hey, I can do this better and treat my employees better. So you went and started it. What, what year was that? Uh, two, 2002. Oh, two. And was that a company that uh, was that Letter Logic or was that something different? That was when I founded Letter Logic. I had been, you know, our company, the company I was working for processed uh, patient statements for hospitals. We printed and mailed hospital bills, but we kept screwing up so badly that I, I became a professional apologist. Um, even though I was VP of sales, I spent all my time apologizing to customers for getting stuff wrong. And um, I couldn't figure out, you know, what was at the core of these difficulties. So I set out to figure it out for myself. And it took me just a few weeks to realize that it was carelessness. And the carelessness was strictly because my coworkers didn't care and they didn't care because they knew that nobody cared about them. And I had just read the book um, Nuts about Herb Kelleher starting Southwest Airlines with his belief that if he took great care of the team, you know, the, the flight attendants and the pilots, that they would be happy and take great care of the passengers and, you know, how that's worked out for Southwest. And that was like a, a, an epiphany for me. So I ran to my boss all excited and saying, hey, I, I think I figured out this customer service problem and I, we just need to take better care of our people. And he literally patted my hand and said, Sherry, you don't know anything about business. Why don't you just go sell something? Oh, my gosh. He did not say that to you. He did. And I, I, I mean, he was right. Heck, you know, I have, <laughs> That's I, I, have a, I have a high school diploma from Newland, North Carolina, Avery County, uh, Newland, North Carolina. And that's all. I had no leadership training, no, no sales training. Um, you know, really my only, the only thing I'd done besides scrub toilets was uh, I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. And Jehovah's Witnesses are typically pretty good at sales because they learn early on how to deal with rejection, <laughs> you know, knocking on doors. And you learn a critical skill of being able to talk to anybody because, you know, we called on the homes of the, the wealthy and famous people who lived on the mountain in front of us. And we called on the very poor who lived in the valley who had no, in, you know, running water indoors. So um, that background as being a Jehovah's Witness was very useful to me. But those were the only two things I had. So when he said I didn't know anything about business, he, he was right. Well, you know, you could be right, but you can also be a, a jerk. <laughs> you know, I think that's where Jesus said, you know, make sure we're spreading the truth in love. We got to make sure that we have the love that comes with it. But so he said, so he makes this uh, patronizing kind of demeaning comment, whether true or not, he still says that. Did you immediately know, all right, I'm leaving. This is dumb. I'm not going to deal with it. Or did it fester over a period of time and then lead you to do something? How fast did you make the change after that? It had been festering because I was a straight commission sales rep, but um, I'm the one who laid all the tile in the IT department. 
I'm the one who was there on the weekends cleaning up the parking lot and pulling weeds and scrubbing the bathrooms. And I just did that out of loyalty to the company because somebody had to do it. And uh, so my, my discontent had been had been growing. Uh, and so I was really a deeply engaged employee and then became a disengaged, especially with that last comment of his. And so um, I walked out that day and never went back in that door until recently, because now it is, um, you know, a really cool uh, restaurant. <laughs> but at the time, it was its old factory over in, in Wedgwood, Houston. So, so you left that day. So the yeah. guy makes the comment and you're, you, that was the straw, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. So what happened next? Did you immediately know I'm going to start a company to compete or did you just say, I can't deal with this. I'll go find another job somewhere else. What he didn't know was that I had already been approached by a local businessmen saying, we've been watching you at this company and we we see that you're the one who's bringing in all the sales and we think you should start your own company. And if you want to do that, we will back you. Wow. So that was a pretty heady experience for me with, you know, having no, no education and no uh, leadership training for these very wealthy men to approach me in that way. And um, that had planted a seed that if they thought I could do it, you know, perhaps I could. Um, And I was very unsophisticated and didn't know much about funding a company, but they, you know, wrote out a term sheet for me on what it would look like for them to back the company for me. And it would lead to me owning 5% starting at a $35,000 a year salary. And at that point I was, you know, making six figures. And so that was pretty easy for me to say no to, um, Hmm. I, I think I've got to back up just a little bit there and explain uh, to your listeners that I came to Nashville to sing. No now, kidding. I, I didn't know that's something I did not know that about your story. But it, of course, that makes sense, right? We're in Nashville. So you came here to sing. Yeah. I, I had been on the TV show, You Can Be a Star. And that was like a precursor to American Idol and the voice where, you know, you have contestants on stage that compete singing. And um, I came in third place. Um, And before you congratulate me, let me explain that there were only three contestants. (laughs) And still. Uh, Such honesty from Sherry Deutschman today. Such honesty. (laughs) But still, I thought I had the goods and I moved to Nashville and um, I hung out. The Bluebird had just opened. And for anyone who's never been to the Bluebird Cafe, you must make that uh, one of your bucket list things to do, to go experience that place. And I heard real talent. And knew I didn't have it. And so, uh, you know, I set out to, you know, get jo- a job. And so I went to work for a company selling cars. And uh, those first couple of years in Nashville were brutally uh, difficult for my daughter and me. Um, I was newly divorced and didn't have child support from her father. And uh, there were times when we couldn't pay the light bill and daycare. And so we just went without electricity. Um I had a cooler where we kept the basics. Um, You know, one of the crushing things that happened was mom and dad came to visit me without warning me. And they couldn't really warn me because I didn't have a phone. Um, And they just showed up and they they freaked out that I was sitting there with no electricity in a cold apartment. And, you know, I explained that we were fine. Here's our milk. Here's cheese. Here's the basics. You can tell we're not starving to death. Um, but they, there were really hard times when I first came to Nashville. And so I'd gone from that to renting an apartment to actually owning a home and driving a Jaguar instead of the beat up old Volkswagen rabbit that brought me to town. That was the ugliest car ever uh, seen in the United States. And to go from that to making six figures. And it, it had been so recently that I couldn't even pay the bills to looking at this man and realizing I'm going to walk out this door today and give up that salary because I don't want to live like this. It was, it was a pretty big turnaround. So this is uh, early two thousands. You come to town in early two thousands. Um, and in Oh two is when you left, left that other company. Right. So that's when that happened. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us about how the transition went. Did you, I know you, you talked about the local businessman who wanted to back you, but they made such, they made an offer that you could refuse. <laughs> so yeah. you, and you refused it. So yeah. what next, what happened next? 
Well, I went straight down to the bookstore and got an armload of books about how to write a business plan and uh, wrote a business plan. And I took it to several people in town that I knew um, that I thought would back me and actually five entities, including my brother-in-law. And I, I went to five of them and said, I, you know, I need like $350,000 to uh, start this company. And, um, and this is the shocker, but all of them said, yes, wow. all of them agreed to do that. But when I started talking to them about my vision for how a company should be run, there was a lot of hesitancy. And so they were willing to fund the company with me being a minority owner and, um, sometimes in, you know, a, a co-owned deal. And so I just said no to everybody and said, I'm going to do this on my own which is crazy when you looking back uh, now, now that I know all that I didn't know, uh, it's crazy that I would uh, turn their money down, but I did. Why do you think, why do you think you knew to turn it down? What, what was there a gut? Was it women's intuition? Was it uh, what, what, what made you turn that down twice? You had twice funders to do this. And, and of course you're going to be in a minority position, but yeah. why did you turn it down? It was the not strings attached. It looked to me like ropes attached. Ooh, that's, that's deep. That's that deep. It would hold me back. That would tether me to doing business in the traditional way. And I, I didn't have a lot of business training, but I have great innate empathy. And I felt like empathy is, and I still believe that empathy is, is a, a really critical leadership trait that is often ignored. And so um, I, I thought that if I leaned into that empathy and followed the, the um, Southwest Airlines model of putting the employees first, that I could build a successful company. So I set up shop in my basement. Uh, you know, first I had a week long yard sale, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my classy neighbors uh, and uh, cashed in my 401k. Um, did not come up with $350,000, my long shot, but I came up with enough that I thought could get me started. And uh, then I went to Goodwill and bought an old table, uh, bought a couple of old filing cabinets and got an old table and pulled it across those filing cabinets to be my desk. And the company that I left, um, my computer, my laptop was so old and worn out that they just let me have it. And so that was the basis for me starting my new company in the basement right next to the washer and dryer. <laughs> Now, was your company, did you, did you name it Letter Logic Day One or was it named something different? Oh, what a funny question. Yeah, I initially named it Mail Magnates because we were printing and mailing ma mail, printing and mailing bills. And for the, la for the first couple of weeks of going by Mail Magnates, I had to explain to people that I was not saying I was a man magnet. <laughs> uh, you know what I that thought flittered through my brain that that's kind of what that sounded like yeah. but now that you say it yes it, that's probably not a good name <laughs> and so uh I came up with something else I love alliteration and uh it and I'm very happy you know even years later with the name I think it was a good one yeah well it, it is alliterative and I love alliteration as a former pastor you know you gotta you gotta do the sermons with the with the alliteration and we'll talk about alliteration later in the mm -hmm. later in our show because I'm gonna go through some stuff that is alliterative so so you started letter logic now was that actually still in 2002 or are we are we further down the the, the calendar a little bit that was 2002 so still in 2002 so you go out and you figure out how to raise money through your just your own determination and grit, your own bootstraps, you raise the money, you started up. Um, so when did, when did it become real to you? I, Cause all of us as entrepreneurs, the people that are listening right now, and, and I know me too, you start companies, but it at some point it becomes like, Holy crap, this is real. This is, I'm actually making money. I'm like, I've got employees. When, how, how long did it take before you were like, wow, this is actually a real thing that's going to work long-term. So. Oh. I don't know when I knew it was going to work long term, but I never intended for it not. I never even considered that it wouldn't. And I, it was real for me from day one because one of my coworkers came with me when I left that company. She came with me and um, I was paying her, but not paying myself. And so that was real, starting off with a with an employee who at the time was 50% partner, which is because I was very unsophisticated and didn't know how the deal should have been structured with me providing all the funding. I learned the hard way. Uh-huh. So you had a, you had a partner. Now, 
I, I don't know the end of the story, but I'm assuming she did not stay a 50 percent partner through the through the duration. No, I, I bought her out a year later. Um, it was, you know, the hard lesson that you it's really difficult to work with friends and family. And so it ended it ended badly. And, um, you know, we're not friends anymore. Mm. But, I have a, I have a similar story. Same kind of thing happened, but it's uh, now, but now we know, right? We learn through the things that we do badly, and we now know on the back end how not to do it. And as a as a business coach on my side, for my side of the table, I I now use that as 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 the ways to help other people. If they're setting up partnerships, I can say, hey, here's something you need to look at. You need to be careful about this. So you and I both know that very terrible lesson and friendships in the wake of that are, are it's a sad sad story. So. Yeah. So now you, uh, so it's, so we're 20 years removed from that start. Now you don't own the company. You sold the company in 2016. So the company really only uh, under your leadership was only there for a little over a decade. Right. So, so 20, I guess, 14 years, if I'm doing my math, right. So why did you, uh, well, let's talk about the growth. Let's go, let me back up. So I'll forget before I ask the why, but when you grew that from the, from the basement, to being worth $40 million, $40 million, well, $40 million in revenue, right? Yeah. How did, uh, what, tell, talk about the growth trajectory. When did things start hitting the million dollar mark and the $5 million, 10 million, and it starts growing exponentially? When did that, how did that happen for you? Um, immediate. I think the, the first year we did 433,000 in revenue and the next year it was like a million four and the next year it was three and a half million. It was very quick. Um, but it was all about our culture. So I I determined from day one that I was going to put the employees first and that they would know they were first and that they would become, you know, they would, their needs would come before that of our customers and would become before my needs or the needs of any other shareholders I would bring in. And so I just made that part of our culture and our story and the way the employees knew that it was real was that I paid them a real fair living wage. I um, helped them all buy their first homes with a gift for the down payment of their first homes. Um, gave them a uh, the ability to bring their kids and their pets to work anytime. Paid for 100% of their medical, dental, disability, and life insurance. Um, helped them start their own companies. So, you know, in a lot of companies, if you um, you know, moonlighting, you won't tell your boss about it. Or if you're trying to start your own company, you would never tell the company you're working for that you were doing that. But I encourage them to, I encourage them to, to be entrepreneurial and start their own businesses. So um, even invested in one of their businesses and he's done really well. And then I think the most critical thing I did to let them know they mattered was a really unique profit sharing plan, which I hope you'll let me talk about a little bit because it was, um, very creative and a game changer for us. And so it was um, a way that every employee saw that they were equally valued regardless of their title or regardless of education. Um, And it was one of the main reasons for our success. But I'm the one who sat in front of prospective clients um, and our clients were big healthcare systems, Um, New England Medical Center in Boston and a Dignity Health in California, and Bon Secours in Virginia, um, and huge healthcare systems, uh, Texas Health. And I would sit with them around their board tables as we were asking for their business and look them right in the eye and say, I need you to understand that I don't believe the customer comes first. But let me explain to you how me putting my, my employees first it's going to benefit you. And then I would tell them about our benefits. And it was so quiet in those rooms. They were dumbfounded first because I was telling them they didn't come first. And then when they heard about all of our benefits, their mouths were just wide open and then frequently got them to say, can we come to work for you? Or <laughs> where, where do we sign And so that became a really critical part of our growth is um, it became people bought our services because of our culture. In fact, um, our sales team said that 85% of the closes they made 
were because of the culture and that the customers would say, I'm choosing you for the culture. And that enabled us to become the most expensive in the nation, in our industry, and to still grow enough to be on that Inc. 5000 list for 10 straight years. Yeah, that's so, a pretty, that's a phenomenal feat. I mean, I, I've got one of my companies has been on there twice, but to do it 10 years in a row, the, the growth, the growth that you've got to get year over year just to make it on the list is really amazing. And then to do it 10 years consecutively, that that's pretty, <laughs> I mean, that, I don't know, I don't know very many people that could do that. I don't know that that many companies have been on the list that many consecutive times. And I love that you share talking about the fact that culture was the key to that to the way that you were able to build that and close so many deals. You said 85% of your deals were closed because of the culture connection. How do you define what culture is? Like, what, what does that mean? So many people talk about it, but they don't know what that means. So what does culture mean to you? I, I think it is um, a very tangible thing that it is the air you breathe in a company. You can feel it. When you walk into the lobby of a company or you walk into the door of a retail shop, it is the very, um, I'm tr- struggling for the word, but it, it, it is, it's not tangible, but it is a real feeling that you get and you know whether or not that's a healthy organization. And um, it just boiled down to everybody knowing they were valued and them valuing one another. Yeah. So I think maybe one of the words you could use to describe this, like the ethos of a company and so yes. what it feels, the DNA, how we act and treat one another, the unspoken ways that the unspoken rules of how we engage with one another. And I, I believe, and I know that you do too, based on your story that, you know, our, our employees as entrepreneurs will never treat our customers better than we treat them. And, and so what you did is you treated your employees in such a magnificent way that your customers couldn't help but notice because the employees were treating the customers the way you were treating them. And there are so you go back to your story, that guy that patronized you and said, just go sell something and shut up. I know he didn't say that, but that, that's, the, he did. <laughs> that's what he said. You know, the way he's treated you is the way you treated your customer. And you, you, you use the word, use the word, uh, you were, a you were an engaged employee and then you started to you were dis, I think you said disenchanted or something like that. And then you disengaged. Uh, How, why, how could you, how would you advise someone besides, Hey, don't be a jerk like that other guy, but how would you advise an entrepreneur and listen to this to make sure that their employees are engaged and not disenfranchised, disenchanted and disengaged? Oh, now you're speaking my love language. Um, It's all about listening to them, really letting them have a voice and, um, and being a transparent, um, we had an open book policy that I'd love to talk more about. And the, the trans, you know, the transparency was vital to our success. And then sharing the profits with them, um, and not, not being greedy, and realizing that the profit sharing creates more profit. Um, I always look at it as, you know, I gave ten percent of the profit to the employees, but taking, you know, a pie this big. And, and just a little slice of the pie this big, giving it back to them every month, investing it back in them every month, made the pie this big. Yeah. So, um, well, talk about your profit sharing. You, you said it was a unique way that you did it. Was it an ESOP or was it something different than that? It was different. In fact, I didn't know what an ESOP was. And by the time I realized what it was, the, the company was really out of the grasp of the employees. The value, uh, the valuation was too high. But I, um, I wanted everybody to be fully engaged and vested in what we were doing because there's so there were a million tiny little things that we could screw up every day that were seemingly insignificant, but that would be have monumental ripple effects. And so um, to get them engaged, what I did was bring them all together every month um, and share the financials with them and let them see the P&L. This is exactly how much money we brought in. And this is exactly how much money we made. And so showing them exactly to the penny how much profit we made. And then we talked about why the results were the way they were. So if we had an extraordinary month where everybody was doing exactly what they were supposed to do, then it would show up on the bottom line. And then when we had major screw ups, (laughs) that would show up on the bottom line. And then, well, why should they care about the bottom line? Because at that very same meeting, 
I took 10%, they saw the bottom line. I took 10% of that and handed out physical checks to each of one of them. But this is the kicker, split evenly. So most profit share plans are done annually or quarterly. They're not really tied to any one person's, really their behavior is just tied to the overall uh, profitability of the company. And, um, and it becomes kind of like an entitlement, something you just expect, and it's done as a percentage of your salary. Well, the salaries are already so hierarchical, you know, because they're based on someone's experience or education. Um, but we weren't like that because I, I thought you've already got that. The profit share is going to be even because everyone is equally valuable in creating profitability. And if you don't think that your janitor is uh, valuable, you just wait till the toilet overflows. Uh -huh. Or um, think about how many times a receptionist or a clerk has turned you off and how they treated you um, in, in a company. And so we gave exactly the same dollar amount to our CFO that we gave to our custodian, that we gave to our head of IT, that we gave to our receptionist. And, um, and that caused something crazy to happen in that everybody was super careful about who we brought in that door to work on the team. They only wanted the cream of the crop because if they were going to be sharing the goods <laughs> equally, they wanted to know that they were equally sharing in the responsibility for creating the bottom line. And it made people have more empathy for one another. Like if, um, if somebody had to be out, or if they were out sick or they had to leave to go to a, um, a child's play, everybody else jumped in to help fill that gap um, so that we could keep the profit numbers up. It changed behavior in a way that nothing else could have. And the fact that it was a paper check, you know, we could have added it to their, you know, automated uh, pay, but it's a paper check. So it's something tangible. And I could look them right in the eye and say, look, look what you did. Look what we did together. And um, it was transformational. It was the single best business idea I've ever had. And um, because of my book, several people are following and now hopefully hundreds of companies are doing it now. And, and I hear from them that this is the game changer. And it's, it's just 10%. It's not a big deal. If I were keeping yeah. it all for myself, I'd be paying it in taxes. Uh, but instead, it's investing back in them. And you talk about engagement. Every month when I would announce, you know, see the, the, the numbers, you know, and when we looked at the bottom line, you could see people visually doing They're the math. They're sort of like, calculating. Oh, am I kidding? <laughs> um, but then no matter what the check was, they were thrilled. And, you know, the first one was $7. And uh, over the years, it, in the months, it got bigger. And uh, at the at the end, it was over $1,000. So if you're making 20 bucks an hour and every month you get, you know, $700, dollars $1,000 that's a game changer for many families. Yeah. Uh, well, and well, I, gotta, I, want, I want to talk about your book, Lunch with Lucy. But before we do that, I want, I've got some just curiosity questions as a, as a business owner myself, you know, sharing the P&L and saying, okay, we brought in a hundred grand this month and we made 10 grand, for example, right? But th that's what we made. Are you showing them every single line item? This is what we spent on advertising. This is what we spent on uh, employee payroll. This is what we spent on. This is how much I took home as the owner. Are you doing that? Or is it more just, here's how much we made. Here's how much we uh, kept. They could see everything except the individual salaries. Okay. And they all knew how much money I made because I went without a raise for seven years until I knew that all of them were uh, you know, paid fair market rate and beyond. And then I felt so guilty about it when I gave myself a raise, knowing how it was going to affect profitability that I stood in front of them and announced that I was giving myself a raise and cried. And so they all applauded. They were happy for me to have a raise. But um, I think most everybody was happy with just, you know, basic numbers. The sales team was not. Uh, they wanted everything. So I would allow them to come into my office and um, pull up a chair right next to me and get into NetSuite, which was our accounting software and, and say, have at it. I didn't even care at that point if they saw the salaries because they made more money than everybody else. Um, but letting them see, you know, to the fraction of a penny, our expenses on every line item, 
And that helped them be better informed about exactly what clients they should go after to drive the bottom line and, um, and the pricing that they needed to have for us to really drive profitability. So um, we had an extraordinary sales team. And I think that a lot of it was because of the transparency and uh, their really knowing what they were uh, trying to accomplish for everybody. So you wrote about that experience with uh, in your book, Lunch with Lucy, Maximize Profits by Investing in Your People. So tell me a little bit about how the book came about and what, uh, what its main focus is. Um, the main focus is around um, listening and having empathy for the employees. But I had a practice of going to lunch every Wednesday with an employee. Um, and I would just choose somebody and invite them to lunch. And it was it, on one of those lunches that I was with a, a new woman in IT, you know, a brilliant code writer. And she was shaking on the way to lunch. And I noticed it. I said, are you OK? And she she said, yeah, I've never been to lunch with a CEO. And so I had to say, well, you know, um, everybody else here calls me the E-I-E-I-O. So do not be afraid of me. And um, I just pulled over and talked to her for a minute and said, I got to tell you, you know, I, I'm, I don't I have only a high school diploma. I don't know one tenth of what you know. I'm intimidated by you. Don't you feel that way about me? And I realized that it, it shouldn't be about going to lunch with the CEO. It needed to be a lot more approachable. So I just created Lunch with Lucy because I like alliteration. And uh, the employees signed up to have Lunch with Lucy and they chose the restaurant. Um, they chose who else would go with us to lunch. Uh, so sometimes they brought a spouse and sometimes um, somebody they were dating, sometimes their entire families, uh, sometimes their entire departments. Sometimes it got to be very expensive, um, but it was a critical time for me just to listen to them. And uh, often they wanted me to go to their favorite restaurant in their, um, in their neighborhoods. So I got to see a little bit more about, you know, their living situation and their culture. It was awesome. And then, um, you know, we just talked about them. And then I got to hear directly from them, you know, what they thought I was doing right or wrong. Um, I got to see the impact of my decisions on them and their families. Um, I got to hear about really critical things they were dealing with at home that I had no idea about. So it created, you know, more empathy for me. Um, you know, understanding their situations and why they were 15 minutes late every day um, or why they absolutely had to leave at 3 p.m. regardless of what we had going on. And I think it was the most valuable time I spent running my company every week was that Wednesday lunch. And um, admittedly, sometimes it was a lot more than an hour. Um, I remember one that went on for like two and a half hours as a whole department ganged up on me about what I was doing wrong. Oh, and I they were right. They were right. And I listened to them. So um, lunch with Lucy, um, it, they still call me Lucy. <laughs> so I'll get texts and and emails and lunch invitations to Lucy, not to Sherry. So it, it became. So does, so is the book just the stories of the lunches you had with the individual people or is it about how to do it or both? It's it's about how. um Empathy can be a transformational um, leadership tool, but it includes lots of, lots of practices, not just the lunch with Lucy, but sharing the financials and why that was beneficial and um, other ways that without, if, if you're a company that doesn't have any money, things that you can do to recognize people, um, how inexpensively you could do lunch with Lucy. In fact, my husband copied me. Um, so about five years into the growth of my company, I started marrying a tree hugger, I mean, dating a tree hugger and ultimately married him. And um, he is a real estate um, developer and uh, sales has a sales team. And he copied me, except instead of his being lunch with Lucy, his was duck out with Deutschman. And he only did his as walks and talks. So if you, um, if you wanted to have a meeting with him, or he just set up a schedule for you to meet with him and just take a walk in the neighborhood, except some of those walks were five miles long, uh, depending on who it was and what they wanted to talk about. But he also found it to be transformational just to have that a long time to walk and talk and hear from them directly. 
Why do you why do you think so many entrepreneurs and founders and CEOs and startup people and why do you think they miss how how to treat their employees? I, I, you know, we watch we watch things. I watch things on CNBC. You know, the profit and all these great shows about business. And I see some of these CEOs and these founders, these entrepreneurs treating their employees like dog crap, yelling at them. And I don't understand why the employees stay. But, but why do you think so many people miss that? What 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 causes someone not to be kind to their employees and and trust them and take care of them? Why why do you think that is? I don't know. Maybe maybe they think they're too busy to take the time, but it it doesn't take time to show kindness. Um, yeah. And maybe it hasn't been modeled for them. I mean, I've had some, I've had some good bosses and I have had some really bad ones. Um, so fear too, isn't it? Fear drives most of um, our behavior. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And, you know, fear of complacency. I, I just don't know. Yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame that, that 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 employees are subjected to terrible bosses. I know there was a movie that came out years ago about that, but but and that was more comedic reference to it. But the reality is there are terrible bosses. And you are sitting here with me on this podcast and have been invited on it because of your tremendous success in part due to a terrible boss. I mean, is that the, the irony? But I think it's not necessarily irony. I think it's the reason, one of the reasons you're successful. So let me ask you this question, Sherry. What how would you define the word success? Hmm. Uh, in some ways, it's just the ability to have a clean conscience at night when you go to bed. Um, and now, you know, now that I've, I've been very successful financially, um, my continued success really depends on me being able to help others afford that same opportunity to build financial independence and wealth. And so um, the degree to which I get to spend the majority of my day helping others is how I view the success of the day or the success of the week or the month. So with that as a definition, do you consider yourself a successful person? Uh, yes, I do. And uh, kind of worn out too, but um, <laughs> there's so much need. I have chosen this niche in, in helping uh, women with their businesses. And there's so much need in that world that, um, you know, I'm working 60 or 70 hours a week again as a, as a supposedly retired person. So, yeah. Well, tell it, tell me a little bit about brain trust and why you started it and what it's doing now for women entrepreneurs. Um, I'm a member of an organization called EO. Um, it is a, a peer to peer membership for um, business owners where you get together every month with seven other business owners and with a great, with total confidentiality and comfort, you share with them the biggest problems you're facing in your company and the greatest opportunities that are, that are coming your way. And they help you vet opportunities and, and see your blind spots and call, they call me out on my, you know, uh, bad decisions or bad behaviors. And that accountability that comes with this peer-to-peer -peer learning was critical to my success. And so I would meet, you know, women entrepreneurs and say, you've got to join EO, but they can't. Um, there are 13 million women business owners in the, in the country, but only uh, less than 2% of them qualify to be in EO or also in WPO, which is the women's president's organization, because both of them require you have a million in revenue every year and that you, um, on at least 50% of your company. And so there's 13 million women that don't have that. Mm. I built brain trust for them to help them get to the million dollar mark. So they could then belong to these other peer led organizations that could help them grow to the 5 million and 20 million and 50 million. If, if that's what they wanted to do. So uh, brain trust is kind of like brain trust is your female magnates. huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's, and, and it's working. It's having a tremendous success for these women. Um, so I'm really, really proud of them. Well, I love that you're committed to entrepreneurship because that's what I'm committed to. I believe that entrepreneurs change the world. Yes. That's what I, that's why I do what I do every day on the podcast and with my coaching clients. I truly believe that entrepreneurs like you change the world because how, how many employees, what was the peak number at any one time that Letter Logic had? How many employees did you have? 
we had 65 at one time. And uh, that was in a, in a phase where I'd, I was really taking us down a bad path and trying to turn us into a tech company. But when we write, when I got a grip on my ego and went back to being, you know, what we were known for, uh, we right sized to about 51 people. And that's how many we have when I sold the company. So, so 50 ish employees at any one time historically, but over the, over the 15, 14, 15 years that you own the company, hundreds of people cycle in and out. I mean, and their families, you know, two or three additional people and their friends and their neighborhoods have been affected and changed because of what you did. And so I don't want people to miss that. I, I, you, you took a risk, you took a chance, you started your own thing. Uh, the reasons why you did are, are irrelevant for, for the, this point, but you did that and lives have changed. The world has changed. And now you're doing it again with brain trust. And I applaud you for that. And I congratulate you for your success. Thank now, you. if I may, I want to, I want to kind of shift a little bit of our conversation around the theory that I have about how success is achieved for entrepreneurs, because that's really why I started the show to begin with. So I want to ask you these questions and Sherry, see if they, uh, or should I call you Lucy? I see if they if they filter through your story the same way. I feel like they filter through everybody's story. So when I started interviewing entrepreneurs casually as a successful entrepreneur myself, asking them how they did it, I, it was casual conversations like at the standard downtown or I'd go to lunch with somebody. I started finding these five things just started. They were everywhere in everybody's story, even though they didn't use the, the same words that I would use to describe it. That's why I started the show. So when I started recording the show, I thought I'm going to record the show, the root of all success. And I'm going to ask the people, I want them to be very successful entrepreneurs like you. And I want to ask them if they believe that these five things showed up. So I'm going to ask you that. So the, the first and most important key to success that opens the door of success for people, I believe is passion. And what I mean by that is not just being excited about it, or you love printing medical bills. That's not what, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is Passion, the root word of passion actually means willing to endure. If you go all the way back to where we got the word, which is why we call the passion of the Christ, why we call it that, because it was about a willingness to endure, not about excitement or joy. It was about a willingness to endure. So in your story, I, I hear passion in your story because you endured the no electricity. You came here and you you took the chance and you set up that old computer and that old Goodwill table downstairs in the basement. I see the passion in you. Is that the way you see it too? Or is there another story of endurance that helped you become successful? I think you nailed it. You know, I was never passionate about printing and mailing bills and I never dreamed I would be in the printing industry um, and, and doing what I was doing. I mean, who could get excited about that? But I, I got really passionate about um, growing a business and being able to support my family all on my own and uh, helping the employees do that too and helping them, uh, you know, I, it became about them. The, my passion was about them and really not so much about the industry or, or, or changing, you know, it was just really a, about them. And so I was willing to endure a lot of things for them. And did endure a lot of hardships through the years. And you did. And, and I love that you were transparent and honest about your story and how you did that. And also appreciate the honesty that you're never passionate about printing, because I know that a lot of entrepreneurs think because they're told by the Instagram gurus of the world that just find what you're passionate about and go do it. Yeah. And that's not really that good of advice because for instance, I'm passionate about cars and motorcycles, but it's not likely I can go out and build the way with my preparation and what I have available to me to build a multi-million dollar business in any one of those, but I can still enjoy cars. And I can still enjoy motorcycles, but where I made my money was in led lighting or in an electrical contract. That's not, I've never been excited about that. So I love that you, I love that you said that. So thank you for that. Now, let me talk about the second key. So you got passion. The mm -hmm. second one, this is where the alliteration comes in. They all start with P. Uh, the second one is place, being in the right place at the oh, right yeah. time. So I believe, I believe that entrepreneurs always have a right place, right time moment or two. Um, and I would be interested to hear what you think about where your right place, right time was. I think right place, right time in an industry that was just beginning to uh, just beginning to crest and uh, just beginning to get commoditized and me being able to say, wow, if I, if I take care of the people, then we can have extraordinary service and we can charge more. So I think it was the intersection there. 
Yeah. And I think also if you, based on your story, the fact that you moved to Nashville, I think had a lot to do with it. Nashville you know, has everything to do with it. If you're <laughs> talking about the physical place. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you, you, you moved here for a completely different reason uh, mm-hmm. to pursue a dream in music that didn't ultimately pan out, but being here got you the job, the job, the job, you know, that led to where you are today. So I think that's cool. So let's talk about that. We got passion. We got place. The third one is people, knowing the right people. And here I made some notes while you were talking and I made some notes to some of the people. Uh, at first, the person, one of the people that thrust, in my opinion, based on what you've told me today, is one of the people that pushed you towards success is the boss who gave you the terrible comment. Even though he was a negative influence, had the he not been there, it's not likely you and I are talking today. Second, uh, the book you read by Herb Kelleher about how to treat people that led you to the conversation with the boss. So Herb, have you ever, did you ever meet him? Did you, did you ever know him or just read the book? No, but I got a letter from him right after that because I was quoted. I think I was quoted in the New York times. And so I got a letter, um, which was, was thrilling. That is cool. So, so you got Herb who indirectly was an influence. You got your boss who was, a, who had a jerk moment. Maybe he wasn't a jerk, but he had a jerk moment. And then the local businessmen. So those men who came to you at the, you know, when you first left and said, Hey, we want to invest in you. Even though you didn't go through with that, I think they influenced you to, Hey, this, this, this thing's got legs. I could probably pull this off. And then your family members who, who said, yes, I'll give you the 350,000, even though you didn't take it. So it seems to me that there's all kinds of people in your story that help put you into success. How do you see it? Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, it, the story would be totally changed without, without even, you know, one of them would totally change the story. Well, uh, the, yeah. Go ahead. So the other people, you know, I, I could talk about the bad bosses, but I had a really good boss who was a former a Navy commander, very gruff, but inside just a softy. And he pushed me outside of my comfort level constantly. Um, I was, before I got into the printing business, I, I was in the medical waste business and um, he had me speaking um, nationwide about the environmental impact of incineration and medical waste. And, um, and so he hired the man who wrote the regs for EPA to train me and, um, and he, he pushed me and I was so uncomfortable with that. I'm an an introvert and feeling like I'm in front of these very highly educated people and I'm going to be speaking on this topic, but without his push, I I wouldn't have done that. Who knows who I would be or where I'll be without him. So a big shout out to Bob Lewis. Hey Bob, way to go, Bob. Look, look what you did. (laughs) Well, so we got passion, be in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people. So the fourth, the fourth key I have discovered through these conversations is that of preparation, the know-how to pull it off. So uh, in your story, you mentioned growing up as a Jehovah's Witness and, and the, the, the missions and the, the, the outreach and the, um, the, the, the evangelism stuff that you had to do prepared you for success as a salesperson, which ultimately prepared you to be a successful entrepreneur. What about, what about you? What do you think prepared you for success? Oh, I think the, the background as Jehovah's Witness was critical. Um, not just in you know the training to be able to speak to anybody, but being able to handle rejection mm. um, because you you got a lot of doors slammed in your face. Mm. Um, but I knew where I was lacking, and you know preparation for me was in just devouring everything I could about entrepreneurship. You know when I, when I became an entrepreneur, I didn't even know that word, and my boss um, that I was working for before he used it occasionally, but he said entrepreneur. And so I, it felt like entrapment, you know, <laughs> um, I, I, um, I just read everything that I could. And so, yeah, I really encourage uh, fledgling entrepreneurs and not even fledgling everybody, no matter how successful you've been, keep reading and learning. So you're prepared for the next thing that comes along. Indeed. Indeed. Well, the last, the last of the five keys is plan. So you got passion, place, people, preparation, a plan. And I don't normally talk about business plans because that's not really what I found to be the the key to success. Although some people have business plans, I want to talk about how you did yours. But what I really mean is, how did you intend to make this happen financially? How did you do it? And and so for for what I heard in your story is that you read that book on how to write a business plan. You wrote a business plan. You went out and had people offer to give you money. But then you're like, eh, that's not the plan I actually want to go with. I'm going to go do a garage sale and do it on my own. I think that's a key to your success. But how do you see plan playing into your success? 
um, interesting. After I wrote my first business plan, after reading all these books, I took it to some men here who review your business plan. And if they like it, they'll invest a little bit and they'll own 10%. And they read my plan and they said, yeah, this is all right, but there's nothing special here. And you're not going to make it because you've got to have something unique that you're you know, entering a mature market and um, you know, just beginning to be very commoditized. And so I stayed up for a couple of days, did not go to sleep thinking about what's the one thing, the well, one thing that I could do that would set me apart from everybody else in the industry. And I got it. And that was it. But in general, I'm not a good example in this regard because I, I'm a fly by the seat of my pants kind of girl. Um, and so fortunately, I have been smart enough to hire really smart people to work with me that, you know, build out the plans and execute on my vision. And so that's a good lesson in there. Yeah, the planning is critical. Um, and if you can't do it, hire people who can. That's right. I agree. I agree. Well, so let me ask you as we, go, as we close the show out today, Sherry, I want to ask you to talk to and give some advice to the listeners. So on, on the listeners to this show span the gamut of entrepreneurship. You got the people who are still employees waiting for that moment. And you got the people who are very, very successful like you. So you got the whole gamut in between. I want you to talk to somebody on the early end of the early end of that spectrum. What would your best advice be for that new entrepreneur or the entrepreneur who hasn't yet got, who hasn't yet got started? You don't know what you don't know. And what you don't know can kill you. And so my best advice is to find your peers and to meet with them regularly. And yes, you need mentors. You need coaches, so don't ignore that. But you also need people who are going down the same path at the, uh, and, and close to the same stage so you can learn from one another's mistakes. And honoring your mistakes is critical. You're going to learn so much more from your mistakes than you will from your um, successes. And so lean into that and share those mistakes widely so you can help other entrepreneurs avoid them. Good advice. How would uh, how would people get in touch with you if they want to reach out? And say, I like this lady. I want to I want to engage with her or somehow, some way. What would you? Well, how would you tell people? Is it to get your book? Is it a website? How would you say? How would you tell well, people? You to know, get I'm going to say get the book. <laughs> By the way, the book won two national awards last year: one gold and one bronze in business books, and and it's done really well. I'm Sherry at SherryDeutschman.com or Sherry D at OurBrainTrust.org. And um, I'm 62 years old today, so email is the best way to get me. <laughs> yes, happy birthday to you. No, this won't come out Thanks. for a few weeks, but uh, happy birthday. And it's an honor to talk to you on your birthday. And I've known of you, and we've run into each other a couple of times in the past, but but I have really didn't know your story. And this has been phenomenal. I'm even more impressed than I thought that I would be. And I, I was anticipating an impressive conversation with an impressive lady, but, but congratulations on all your success. And I'm, I'm very, very honored that you chose to do the show with me today. And I hope that maybe we can connect and do some more work together since we're both here in the Nashville area. Maybe we can do something to help entrepreneurs change this world. Uh, thank you. It was just a joy to be with you. Well, there you have it. What an amazing story from another very successful entrepreneur and Sherry Deutschman telling us how she got LetterLogic started and built it up and sold it and then went on to do Brain Trust. I, I just pinch myself at how cool these stories are and how great these people are that I get to meet doing the show. And I'm hopeful, hopeful that you are able to, to uh, pull out the value that I think that's here in stories like Sherry's. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, I, I hope you'll reach out to her. Go, go, go get the book, Lunch with Lucy, Maximize Profits by Investing in Your People. And for those of you that are familiar with my coaching program, The Exit Accelerator, you know that the fourth step in the exit without exiting process is invest in people. And I talk about that all the time. And so now that uh, I know uh, Sherry's story, I'm going to have to go get that book and, and maybe roll in some of her content and concepts into my coaching program with the Exit Accelerator. So um, we all need coaches in life. And I want, to sit, I want to finish out the show today with making a comment about the Successful Entrepreneur Online Learning Community. I, this is a community that I created in late 2021 to be a membership opportunity for people who want access to business coaching, but maybe they don't have the time, they don't have the money to hire a full-time business coach, or maybe they have a full-time business coach, they just want a different perspective from time to time. 
So what I do with TSE or the successful entrepreneur is I give, I do weekly live trainings with all of the TSE members from all over the world. So for instance, twice a month, I do an open Q and a called ask Jason live. And I do one in the morning and I do one in the afternoon and different days of the month so that you can log in and you can submit questions ahead of time. Or you can ask questions live, anything about financial literacy, leadership, sales, or entrepreneurship in general. You also get access to a success lecture. I do a live success lecture once a month where I talk about some topic related to the to entrepreneurial the entrepreneurial life and how we live it and how we do better at it. And it could be about money, it could be about finances, uh, about taxes, it could be about sales, whatever it is, I give one hour lecture once a month and I do that live and you can log in and watch live. Then third, I'll, I do an entrepreneur master series two times a month where I bring in an outside guest and we do a deep dive, kind of like what we do here on the podcast, except it's not about the story as much as it's about the tactics. How did you do this? What did you do? So for example, I've had people on here to do the EMS on how to create mailbox money through online businesses. I've done one on um, the, the three things that you need to know to, uh, to maximize profits in your business that doesn't cost you any money. I've had a guy on here talk about how to get a million dollars in unsecured line of credit for your business. These are really good tactical things from the Entrepreneur Master Series. You get all of that for only $55 a month. Only $55 a month for dollar for dollar for coaching. It is absolutely the best dollar you're going to spend to get a business coach like me. And I would love to have you be a part of our community. Not only do you get that, but you get discounts and other things. You get access to live events. There's an online forum. There's a content library where you get access to all the previous recordings of videos that I just mentioned a moment ago. Go to therealjasonduncan.com slash TSC. That's therealjasonduncan.com slash TSC and sign up. You owe it to yourself to get extra coaching, more coaching, or even some coaching if you don't have any at all. TheRealJasonDuncan.com slash TSE. I'll see you in the community. Well, tune in again next week when I talk with yet another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, I'm The Real Jason Duncan, and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.